Well, tonight it's my honor and a privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. James Chestnut. Around the world, in the United States, Australia, France, Norway, Italy, Spain, and the list is growing and growing. His first degree is a Bachelor of Education in Physical Education. His second is a Master's of Science in Exercise Physiology. That allows him to interpret and collect the research that is out there. As I've mentioned, this material is changing lives. He is speaking about your daughter and your son and your parents and perhaps your future children because you make the change now, you get to change the future generations. When you see him speak, it comes from a very personal place because it is. Could you please help me in, and join me in welcoming Dr. James Chestnut. As Dr. Baxter mentioned, I'm very privileged now to speak all over the world. And no matter where I go, there's one thing that we seem to be have in common everywhere, especially in the industrial world, and that is that we're losing our health at a great rate. That we're getting sicker and sicker as time goes on, not healthier and healthier. And the other thing is, is that I think that we all understand that health is our greatest asset. The fact is, is that we know that, and we openly admit that health is our greatest asset, that it's the single most important thing in our lives and the lives of those that we love. And we also openly admit that we're not expressing the, the level of health uh, the, in terms of our potential. My question is why? And the answer to that is really what tonight's about. Why don't we choose the apple over the donut? The answer is not because we don't understand that the apple's better for us than the donut. The answer is because we don't really understand the devastation of that donut and the devastation of missing that apple. The answer is really that at a conscious level, we have no idea really of the actual consequences of our choice. We are marketed literally to death, no, no pun intended. We are marketed to death to believe that our choices don't really have a consequence for us. You don't equate those foods with early death and cancer, and diabetes, and heart disease, and ADHD for your kid, and acne, and acid reflux, and depression, and anxiety, and Alzheimer's, and dementia. You don't equate the donut with that. And you don't equate the apple with significantly reduced risk of all those things and a happier, longer, better life. You think the donut might pack on a few extra pounds. You think the donut make, might make your kid a bit squirrely for a little while. The truth is, it's poison. How many of you can drink the water from a stream within five miles of your house. Now, we're in Victoria. This is God's country. I'm usually talking in, you know, Manhattan. But I'll tell you that probably there's very few, if any of you, in this room who can drink water from a stream within five miles from your house. Was that true 300 years ago? How can we think that we can poison our streams and not poison ourselves? How can we think that the animals are dying in these streams and we're okay? That makes no sense if you understand science. How many of you would like to drink the water from the runoff of the farm that grows your children's fruit and vegetables? When we can step back and see ourselves through the eyes of a biologist rather than a pathologist, when we can step back and understand that we are the sickest species on earth, there's no other species that comes close to the heart disease, cancer, obesity, diabetes, acid reflux, anxiety, depression, murders, anger, resentment. Lack of feeling of belonging. We're in some trouble. And the truth is, until you understand why we're in trouble, then the things that you do to try to resolve it can't work. The two most important questions are, why are we sick? And what do we need to do to get and stay well? Why are we sick? And how do we get well? The truth is, right now, the prevailing belief system about why we are sick is because of bad luck, bad germs, or bad genes. That's bad science. We are not sick because of bad luck, bad germs, or bad genes. We are sick because of bad choices. And we bioaccumulate the effects of those bad choices with time, and they catch up to us. As long as you believe that you're sick because of bad luck, bad germs, or bad genes, then you feel you have no power to influence your outcome in terms of your health. You feel that it doesn't really matter whether you have the apple or the donut because that's not really what determines your well-being. I'm here to tell you and show you with the best science in the world, from the best journals in the world, that, you're, that what determines whether or not you're going to be sick or be well 
as how you eat, move, and think. But we were told to shut up and butt out about our health. We were told to leave it to the experts. The truth is, you need to be the expert. If you're not the expert, you have no chance. You cannot leave health to anybody but yourself because it's your choices that are going to determine your health. You can't blame anybody else. You have to take responsibility for that. But you have to have some knowledge so that you can do that. You know, give them a fish or teach them how to fish kind of thing. Do you remember when all the fish died in the Great Lakes? Do you remember when the Great Lakes started to die off in the 70s? Yeah? Do you remember when they started washing off on the shore with tumors and they were sick? And do you remember the birds that ate those fish, their eggs were brittle and they were not producing offspring and were very worried about the extinction of the birds as well? Is that fair to say? Okay. How many of you think any biologist in their right mind would get up in front of you and say, you know, clearly the problem we have with the fish in the Great Lakes is genes. The problem, the reason the fish have cancer and are overweight and diabetic and have all these other issues is because of genes. And so the solution is to dump drugs into the lakes or set up little tiny fish hospitals with little tiny fish tools on the shore of the lake. And when they wash up, we'll try and give them surgery before they're dead. How many of you think that would be logical? Why would you think it logical for the human species? Why would it be so silly that we could giggle about it if it was fish, and yet not so silly if we start talking about human beings? Toxicity and deficiency are the root cause of all illness in all living things. Now, if you have toxicity and deficiency in your life, your body's going to go into a state of adaptation because it wants to survive. If you're at a state of 7 out of 10, remind me one more time, please. What's the only way we can get well? We must move towards 10. Are we in, everybody's in agreement? Which does that, drugs or surgery? <laughs> That's an important question. So two things always happen when we put stress into our life. The first thing is, is that we lose our lifespan. Our cells start to divide quicker, we have more cell damage, and we actually have less lifespan. But more importantly, the quality of our life also decreases. And life be becomes more of a struggle day to day. And what I'll tell you is it does not matter what drug you get when you're in that pool with that rock in your backpack. The only thing that matters is getting the rock out of the backpack. And what I want to talk to you about tonight is taking control about what rocks go in and what rocks you're going to take out. And understanding that there's nothing, nothing in the treatment of the issues that come from having that rock in your backpack that are ever going to solve the cause of the issues. And until we address the cause, we have no hope. And the cause is not bad genes or bad germs or bad luck. It's bad choices that put rocks in our backpack. Understand? And can we all agree that that donut is stressful? Is that a stressor? Is that a rock in our backpack? Anything that's a rock in your backpack is driving you away from health. I need to bring these things to your conscious level. Then I'm going to teach you how to change. That's the most important thing. Many of you in this room have already tried many times to change your behaviors and it didn't work. Do you want to know why? Because you tried behavior modification and that just can't work. Belief system, behavior. Belief system, behavior. Belief system always determines behavior. I love chocolate. Behavior, I eat chocolate. <laughs> behavior modification, I love chocolate, I'll never eat chocolate. I love chocolate, I'll never eat chocolate. But, but I love chocolate. <laughs> I hate exercise. I hate exercise. I'm going to get up at 5.30 every morning. I hate exercise. I'm going to get up at 5.30 every morning. Usually that happens before the first morning. The truth is, is that you've all tried to modify your behaviors in the past, and then when, you did that, when, that, when that very poor strategy failed, you told yourself that you were a failure. You told yourself that you didn't have enough willpower. That's absurd beyond belief. Someone didn't give you the right tool. What stress really does, and understanding that the whole concept of the reason I've had such great success with this, is because I allow people to change by floating downstream towards health, instead of struggling upstream against it. Many of you now equate getting healthy with deprivation. The truth is, the deprivation lies in staying sick. That's where the deprivation is, not in being well. And I will tell you that once you change your belief system, that once you start exercising regularly, you, you, you would be devastated if you couldn't. Ladies and gentlemen, how many of you are under constant stress? If we include, as Hans Selye taught us, that any time you eat, move, or think in ways that aren't genetically congruent, that's a stressor. How many of you think are under chronic stress, have rocks in your backpack all the time? Everybody or everybody? 
Everybody, I know. I'm here to help you get the rocks out, not to make you feel better with the rocks in. That's the difference. You're welcome. I'm sure that was my mom who started that. Thanks, mom. The other thing is, is that when we're stressed out chronically, we use up a hormone called serotonin. Serotonin is produced to get us back to balance and homeostasis after we've fired off the stress parts of the brain called the amygdala and the locus ceruleus. I don't think it matters, but it makes me sound smart, so I'm going to name them. And just in case you've got a couple of neuroscientists in the room, I, you know, I want to have some credibility. But the, the, but the reality is, is that, is that when you fire off your, your anxiety and your stress response in your body, well, the way to normally get back to that is two ways. One is motion fight or flight, movement, it fires off these movement pleasure pathways and allows us to get that serotonin, which is why chiropractic is so important. I mean, chiropractors don't even get this. Well, the two here tonight, tonight do, but many don't. These are really the five physiological pillars of chronic illness. And I want you to know, they, it starts with the stress hormones. As soon as you eat, move, or think in a way that's, that, that's stressful, that's not genetically congruent, you're gonna, that's a stressor, that's a rock in your backpack, and then you're going to get insulin resistance, you're going to get chronic inflammation, which is at the root of all kinds of chronic fatigue, uh, um, fibromyalgia, I mean, heart disease is very inflammatory. All these things are so related. Decreased sex hormone biology, decreased immunity. I want you to know, listen very carefully. And we're, gonna, we're, we're moving forward here quickly, I hope. I don't even know what time it is. I'm going to get kicked off here. But the reality is, is that the donut pushes you here. Unquestionably, unequivocally, the donut pushes you here. The apple pushes you away. That's the reality you need to take home tonight that the donut pushes your kid here and the apple pushes your kid away. You will see that we are bioaccumulating in our species the effects of our toxic and deficient lifestyle. We are now producing the sickest, the sickest generation of children in the history of the human species. We have more kids with obesity and diabetes and cancers and acne and ADHD and depression and anxiety than ever before in the history. I mean per capita, not gross numbers. We are producing the sickest generation of children our species has ever seen. Ever. 75% of deaths are preventable. They're caused by lifestyle, by, or suicide by lifestyle. That's a fact. That the vast majority of the money we spend on sickness care, which they call health care, which is absurd, it's sickness care. The vast majority of the money we spend, the vast majority of the people are filling the hospitals. The vast majority of the people are dying are dying from suicide from lifestyle choice. And no one's standing up and telling them. This year alone in the United States, a million people will die of heart disease. Is that because they forgot to take their pills? No, they will take their pills, more pills than ever before in history, and they will die. The majority of deaths from chronic health conditions in the United States are of environmental origin, not genetic. If your body is your house, and your house is on fire, who should you call? The fire department. And when the fire department arrives, what will they do? Well, they'll come out with the two tools that they have, axes and fire hoses, drugs and surgery. And so they will smash out, they'll get out their axe and they'll smash out your windows, they'll smash down your door, they'll smash it into the walls of your house, and then they'll bring in their fire hose and they'll spray all your cherished belongings and soak everything down. And if they get there on time and don't make any mistakes and you call them on time, is it possible they could save the life of your house? Absolutely. And should you be grateful? Eternally. Of course. My question to you is this, what's left when they leave? A mess. Now would you think it intelligent to call the fire department back the next day to get your house back to working order? Would you think that the same tools that are used in a fire in an emergency to stop your house from dying would be the same rational tools that you would use to restore your house to homeostasis and balance? Or would you need someone with a totally different set of expertise? Would you need the general contractor? You'd need someone who knew how to do what? N knew what your house needed in order for it to get back to well-being. If all you've got is a drug and surgery, how can you tell me you're about health care and wellness and prevention? What is it about that that's going to help people get well and get back to balance? Heart disease, $501 million. Cancer, $430 million. Digestive disorders, $337 million. In 2002, spending reached $3.5 billion per day, per day. What drug or surgery, what part of the rainforest are we going to be able to grind up? What shark fin will we be able to grind up? Where is this miracle drug going to come from that's going to solve a problem created by not eating proper foods? Which drug is going to solve problems created by not feeding ourselves or our children proper nutrition? 
Where's the hope in that? What drug is ever going to solve a problem created by being sedentary? Is there a pill out there that we're ever going to find at any time, regardless of how much money we spend on it? Is there any pill out there that's going to solve a problem created by not exercising? Is there any pill out there that's going to solve a problem by not teaching our children how to love themselves and deal with adversity? And that they're respected and honored. And that we respect and honor ourselves. And that we're part of a community. And that we feel important and we contribute to the economy. Is there any drug that's going to fix those issues? No chance. Prevent up to 47% of cognitive impairment. Prevent up to 62% of Alzheimer's and 52% of dementia from walking. That's the movement learning pathways, the movement brain stimulation pathways that chiropractors are so good at, by the way. They are, because those pathways are basically from movement of your spine. It's not all from movement of the blood. A lot of it's from movement of the spine. Most of the receptors to feed your brain, the movement learning and movement pleasure pathways, come from movement of your spine. And if your spine's not moving properly, you can't feed your brain those nutrients. I, I lecture all over the world about that, and there's all kinds of great research on it. But I've got to leave you now with something that you can take home tomorrow and have a different life. Yes? Yeah. Right. Well, one of the great questions I get, I remember I had a very good interview I did in Manhattan, and the guy said, well, you know, listen, Dr. Chester, what the listeners really want to know is what about the kids? And I said, well, listen, here's what you need to know about your kids. You can't tell your kids not to do what you are doing, and you can't tell your kids to do what you're not doing. The greatest gift you'll ever give to your children is to role model. Chiropractic fits into wellness. Wellness doesn't fit into chiropractic. Chiropractic is an integral part of a, of a wellness model, and chiropractors are perfect. Uh, the, the original concepts of chiropractic are a perfect marriage with the concept of wellness, because both are about restoring function and, and, and finding out and studying and through science what it takes to express potential rather than what it takes to treat the effects of illness. And that's medicine's role. Chiropractic's role is to find out what we need to express our potential. When people are dying because of how they eat, move, and think, they are committing suicide with their lifestyle choices. And they keep getting told that they're sick because of bad luck or bad germs or bad genes. And the truth is, they're not. They're sick because of bad choices. And until they change those choices, it doesn't matter how many drugs they take or how many body parts they get removed with surgery or how many other surgical procedures they have, they have no chance of being well and they have no chance of teaching their children how to be well. And that is extraordinarily motivating for me. And it, uh, I just, I cannot rest uh, until people hear the truth.